Father, we want to thank you today that this is, once again, the day that the Lord has made. And, Lord, we will rejoice. We will be glad. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together once again as the people of God, as the family of God in this house. And, Lord, we worship you. We praise you. We open up our hearts afresh, Lord, to allow you to speak to us this morning through the teaching and preaching of your word. And we thank you, Lord God, that illumination comes. We thank you, Father, that revelation comes. Uh, we declare, Lord, that your word is uh, absolutely God-breathed uh, and uh, it is profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof, and for instruction in righteousness. Uh, so we thank you, Father, for speaking to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of today's message is Choose Your Best Life Today. Uh, choose your best life today. And uh, as we launch out, I want to start with reading from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. And here is uh, God speaking to the people. Uh, God's using um, Moses as, uh, as his spokesman, uh, so to speak, to speak to the uh, uh, Hebrew people. He says, today, I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. All that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. All right. Fantastic scripture. Um, let's us know that uh, God's given us uh, the privilege and the ability to choose we are free moral agents in every respect. We can choose to love God or choose not to love God. Uh, we can choose to go this way, choose to go that way. Uh, it's been said that our ability to choose is one of the things that sets us apart from animals, uh, even though that some people would have us believe that we're all animals, but we're not. We're God's creation. Uh, we're the crown of God's creation. The Bible says that we are the apple of his eye. Uh, we are made in the image and in the light of God. That is not so with animals. Uh, um, of course, um, uh, the, you know, they say that, uh, you know, what animals choose as well. So the question we could ask is, did the lion, when he looked over the land uh, and saw two herds of uh, animals uh, out of which he was going to pick one, did he choose the left side or the right side? Well, he just followed his instinct. But you and I, we can choose. Um, and uh, so that's one of the privileges that we have as a human being, and we ought to make our choices wisely. Uh, you know, many times people don't, choose at all. They just let life push them along and they drift and they float through life. They let circumstances and situations uh, determine which way that they're going to float, but we can choose. Sometimes people make choices all right, but they make the wrong choices. Uh, and it's been said that, you know, with young people, they, get, they put them through programs to teach them to make wise choices, but actually everybody needs to make wise, wise choices, not just young people. Have you know that, that uh, mature people can make dumb decisions just the same. So it's not just about youth making silly decisions. We, we all need to be encouraged to make the right decisions. Um, interesting too, he says that all that you would choose life, all that you would choose life. Um, but uh, he encourages them on which choice to make but he doesn't make the choice for them. And friends, you and I, we can be encouraged to make the right choice, but in the end, only we ourselves can make the choice. Interesting, uh, we see here that our choices not only affect our lives, but they also affect future generations. He says, the older you would choose life, that you and your descendants might live. And you know, the reality is that decisions that our parents have made uh, have affected us, haven't they, uh, uh, to whatever extent. And so, uh, the, uh, friend, the, the encouragement today is that we make good decisions, not just for ourselves, but we make good decisions uh, for the next generation. I want to read a passage of Scripture from the book of Hebrews chapter 11. And speak to you today, uh, virtually for the remaining time that we have together, about uh, Moses' choices, Moses' decisions that he made. In fact, there are six life-shaping, life-defining choices that Moses made, and we can learn from that. So if you like, we're doing a character study out of the Old Testament. Uh, well, in this instance here, we're reading uh, from Hebrews chapter 11, uh, what we call the, 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 the Hall of Faith. 
uh, where all God's hearers of faith uh, uh, that are listed there uh, have walked by faith. And the encouragement to you and to me today is that we also walk by faith and that we make good decisions. Interesting uh, that Moses' decisions positioned him into the very center of God's will. Sometimes people float around the edges of God's will for their life but never fully get into it or, or, or only partially. Um, but, uh, but Moses made the decision he was going to be smack bang in the middle of God's will for his life. And it really cost him. Uh, there was a real cost attached to it, but there was incredible rewards afterwards. And this is the deal, friends, that you and I need to realize that serving Jesus, there is a cost attached to it, but there are eternal rewards. And I guess that's, uh, uh, I'm already sort of uh, um, stealing my own thunder, uh, as it were, because I was going to lead up to a, a, you know, a big point and then big crescendo to say, look, uh, yes, there's a great cost uh, to serving Jesus, but here is all the rewards. Uh, and so uh, let's just look launch out uh, into this uh, passage of scripture here from Hebrews 11 verse 23 uh, to learn from one of God's greatest leaders in the Old Testament. Uh, it says verse 23 that by faith Moses was born, his, pa his parents hid him for three months because they saw the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith when he grew up Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be ill-treated with the people of God than to enjoy sin's fleeting pleasure. Uh, he regarded abuse suffered for Christ to be of greater value or greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for his eyes were fixed on the reward. By faith he left Egypt without fearing the king's anger, for he persevered as though he could see the one who is invisible. What an amazing summary of Moses' uh, decision-making. Um, and uh, just by way of background, uh, many of you know the story. You've read through uh, Genesis, through Exodus, uh, where this whole story is described in detail. Uh, Israel is a nation, is a people, um, all the sons of Jacob uh, ended up in Egypt uh, through the, uh, due to the fact that, uh, that uh, there was a famine in the land and uh, because his brothers, uh, um, let me start again, that one of, uh, one of um, uh, Jacob's son ended up as the second in charge in Egypt. Long story short, uh, here is Jacob uh, and some uh, 72 people ended up in Egypt uh, under the blessing of the then Pharaoh who looked after them gave them the best of the land and they thrived, they multiplied, they did well until a new Pharaoh arose and started to feel very threatened by these Hebrew people within their country. And they said, these people have become very powerful. Uh, we need to watch it. Otherwise, when we get attacked, they're going to join our enemies and we're going to be subdued. So why don't we put them into slave labor and why don't we make them serve us and why don't we... Uh, put them through hard rigor um, so that uh, we will not uh, be overcome by them. Furthermore, the king made a decision. He instructed the midwives of the Hebrew people. They said to the midwives, look, uh, when you go and uh, get to the delivery of a child, if it's a, if it's a girl, let it live. But if it's a boy, you shall kill him. Uh, and of course, the midwives disobeyed the king in this instance. Uh, how many you know that sometimes uh, when certain laws are pressed down on us, uh, if they break one of God's laws, it's quite okay to say, well, no, uh, King, we will not do that uh, because we are answering to a higher authority. Uh just tragic that recently uh, the abortion law sort of uh, got into uh, the, the country, the nation of Ireland, and now every doctor there is supposed to perform abortions. I mean, how bad is that? Uh, it's just what's wrong with, with, with people when, when these laws, that's why you and I need to fight that agenda. Uh, anyway, I was just slightly getting sidetracked here, but let me tell you that uh, in this instance here, the, the midwife said, no, no we're not going to do that. Uh, um, so it ended up being that Moses was born um 
His parents hid him for three months until he could be hidden no longer. Then his mother took uh, the boy down to the Nile River, um, which of course runs straight through, uh, through Egypt there. She had made a basket, put pitch under it so that the basket would not sink, uh, put the baby inside, put the lid on it, and let the basket float down the river right at the space and at the place where the king's daughter would come down to bathe every day. And she left uh, uh, the baby's sister there and said, keep an eye on what's happening here. Well, here comes uh, Pharaoh's daughter. She's down bathing with all of her attendants there, and she sees a basket floating down the river, and she said to one of the girls, go out there and get this basket. They brought it in, open up the lid, and here is a three-month-old baby inside. Um, and somehow, by the blessing and by the favor of God, she fell in, li- in love with this baby right there, decided to adopt the baby. Uh, as her own. Uh, and then she sort of looked around and says, oh, it's a Hebrew, it's a Hebrew child. Uh, uh, because somehow, you know, this doesn't mean a great deal to us uh, in New Zealand, but uh, in places overseas, but based on the, on the way that people are dressed, by the cloth, by the color, by the pattern, you know that this is a certain ethnicity. And of course, uh, um, the, uh, the Pharaoh's daughter recognized that this was a Hebrew child. Um, and so she looked around and she saw Moses' sister there and she says, uh, oh, come here, go and find me a nurse for this child. And, and uh, Moses' sister ran and called her mother, who was also Moses' mother, uh, ended up nursing the child, uh, and which is kind of incredible how, you know, right, right uh, in that situation there that, that uh, Pharaoh ended up paying for the upbringing of the child, and uh, the very mother uh, of, the, of the child was able to bring the child up legally now until it was weaned and then gave it back to uh, Pharaoh's daughter. And all of that uh, to say that this is the background of the story uh, until Moses got to 40 years of age. And by the way, Moses' mother would have spoken life over that child. She would have told him that he was special. Uh, She would have told him that he was a Hebrew boy, even though you're going to grow up in in the palace, uh, in in, in in Pharaoh's court, but you are a Hebrew boy. Uh, You're a Jewish boy, and you're special. There's a plan of God on your life, and saying all the right things, and it's all good for us to to tell our children that they're special and they have a plan of God on their lives. Bible says that one day when Moses reached 40 years of age, it came into his heart to go and see his people who were by now enslaved. And, uh, and in, in fact, uh, it tells us that it came into his heart to want to help his people. He didn't know the full plan, so he went down there and he saw that one of the Egyptian guards was mistreating one of the Hebrew people uh, uh, people there, and so Moses looked this way, and he looked, he looked that way, and he struck that Egyptian guard and actually ended up killing him. So he hit him in the sand, hoping that nobody had seen it, and he went away again. The next day, he went back down again. You know, there was a drawing, there was a drawing in him to be with God's covenant people. You know, once we're born again, friends, there's a drawing that we want to spend time together, that we want to journey together. It's an inner thing. It's, it's built in, uh, and that's what was in... in uh, Moses as well. So he went down there again, and he saw two Hebrew guys fighting with each other. And he says, why do you fight with each other? You guys are companions. You're, you're brothers. And one of them turned around and said, well, so what? Who made you a judge over us? What are you going to do? Are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian guard yesterday? And of course, by now, Moses thought, oh, oh uh, this thing is known, uh, and I am in serious trouble. And the Bible tells us that Pharaoh find, found out about it, and he wanted to kill Moses. Now, um, of course, uh, Pharaoh, in some respects, was Moses' adopted grandfather. And Moses had grown up uh, in the courts of Pharaoh. Um, In fact, history tells us about uh, Moses, that he was actually quite a guy in his own right. He had been trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Uh, he had already uh, led as a general some of the uh, Egyptian army in different campaigns around the place victoriously. Uh, in fact, uh, there is an indication that Ramses, uh, or Ramesses, however you pronounce that, was the pharaoh at the time. And so Moses was actually quite a guy in himself. He was well trained. He would have learned the sciences. 
he would have certainly learned to read and to write, uh, which wasn't common in those days at all. He had learned about organizing, administration, leadership. Uh, it's all the stuff that God says, I want to use that. Uh, first and foremost, I'm choosing Moses because of his heart. But I'm also choosing him because of his ability and the gift and, the, and the, the wisdom. Because later on, when Moses was responsible to lead two, three, four, five million people out of Egypt on into the promised land, he knew how to organize them. He knew how to set up camp. He, in fact, he actually knew the area out there because later on, that's where he fled to. He went out... Uh, into an area called Midian, uh, fled away from Pharaoh's court uh, because Pharaoh by now tried to kill him. And so here is Moses out there, 40 years of age, and he's, he's been brought up at the king's court, and now he's a shepherd boy. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, it's an interesting thing, but uh, when he was 40 years of age, it came into his heart, there's a calling of God on my life to help God's people. I'm going to go down there. And so he messed things up good and proper. So he ran away. He's out there in the wilderness another 40 years. So by now he's 80 years. And, uh, you know, he'd been trained in the wisdom of all the Egyptians for 40 years at, at, uh, at um, you know, Pharaoh's court. But he's out there in the wilderness learning about himself, learning about God, developing character. Um, and the fact that he struck the Egyptian uh, um, guard there and knocked him down would let us know that potentially he might have been a bit of a, had a bit of a short handle. Uh, and having grown up at the king's uh, court, you know, he might have just felt a little bit privileged. Who knows? Uh, but it took God 40 years to get all of that out of him, to bring him to a place of humility and to bring him to a place where God really could use him. It's an interesting thing, but sometimes when we think we can, you know, we're like, we're, we're going to do this for God. We're going to do that for God. And it's easy. We can, we can handle it. You know, too much self-confidence gets us into trouble. And if there's too much self-confidence there, there's no anointing there. But when we recognize that anything we do for God, we really can't do it without God's grace and without God's strength and God's grace and God's anointing can flow through us better. Um, and so here's Moses, uh, uh, 80 years of age. He's out. And of course, we know about the experience at the burning bush. God appears to him and he says, Moses, uh, I've raised you up. I want you to go and deliver my people. I want you to go and see Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh straight in the face, let my people go. And all of that became the starting point now of this very passage that we've just read out of Hebrews chapter 11, that by faith, when Moses was born, his parents had hidden him for three months, and then he started to, when he grew of age, he started to make some decisions that you and I should emulate in our own life, in our own situation. Uh, we can learn from that. Uh, and of course, uh, initially, Moses said, I can't do this. I'm not the right man. Uh, and, of course, one of the reasons for that would have been because, uh, because um, <laughs> Pharaoh still had a death contract out on Moses. Nothing's changed. Uh, Moses wanted to kill him 40 years ago. Moses still wants to kill him today. And now God says, the very one that, uh, that you ran away from, I want you to go. I want you to face him. And sometimes God asks uh, uh, things from us that scare us outright. I remember when God called me to preach, uh, uh, called me to, to, to minister the word of God in a kind of a public capacity. Um, the very thought of it scared me, or like it just so scared me. It was just incredible. It's like, oh God, I can't do this. Uh, and then, and then, a bit like Moses said, but I can't speak properly. You know, it would indicate that Moses might have had a speech impediment. Uh, we don't know exactly what it was. Uh, and because when God called me, he said, God, I got this accent. You know, like uh, I can't do this, Lord. Uh, and and uh, and I, by now, I'm in a, in an English-speaking country. English is my second language. Uh, and Lord, I can't do this. So sometimes God calls us to do things like, oh, it just takes the, it takes the, the breath away. Uh, and, and yet God says, by my grace, you can do these things. So we step out, we step out humbly, we step out relying on the grace and on the favor of God. And somehow it all comes together and God knows how to empower us and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and so forth. And so amazing how uh, God had this man trained up in the very courts of Pharaoh. And you know, many times God trains us up in the world with certain wisdoms, with certain understandings, and God wants to then draw on that at a certain stage and says, I want to use that in the kingdom of God. Um, and so all of that to say that uh, 
I want to read through those six decisions uh, that Moses made, six choices that he made to kind of summarize them, and then I want to break them down and see what that means to you and to me today. It says, uh, first of all, point number one there, when he grew up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Of course, his parents' decisions to hide him for three months, that was not his own decision, uh, but it certainly affected him. <laughs> it let him live, that they wasn't going to have him killed, and they hid him, and so forth. But now he is of age himself. When he grew up, he began to make certain decisions, and they were good decisions, by the way. And you know, sometimes uh, the level of our grown-upness, grown-upness, I think we just made up a word, the level of our grown-upness can be determined by the choices we make. We make dumb decisions, one after the other. We're perhaps not as grown up as what we might claim to be, but uh, in the end, we don't have to prove to people that we're grown up and say we're grown up. It's just watch the decisions that we make. That tells us as to how grown up we really are. And so Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You know, Moses at that stage, 40 years of age, he was at the courts of Pharaoh. There was nothing lacking. Everything was laid on. He had fame. He had prestige. He had power. He had money. He had, like, there wasn't even any, any, any uh, question about money because everything was laid on for him. Uh, he was dressed like an Egyptian, uh, probably would have not looked too dissimilar, even though he was a Hebrew boy. Uh, but it's, I guess, we might say uh, Middle Eastern, uh, what we might call sort of olive skin type people. They were not whites. They were not blacks. They were uh, olive uh, skin type people. He was dressed uh, as an Egyptian. Uh, uh, He spoke like an Egyptian. He spoke their language. Uh, Accent and everything was perfect. Everything was right. But on the inside, he felt like one of God's covenant people. Um, And he got to the stage where he said, I can't, can't do this anymore. I got everything laid on, but I'm miserable on the inside. You know, sometimes people's lives are miserable, but sometimes not miserable enough to make some better decisions or to make some decisions that will lead them towards a better life. So he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He says, I am out of here. I'm now going to identify with God's covenant people. And even though it gets me into trouble, this is exactly what I'm going to do. Number two, he chose rather to be ill-treated with God's people than to enjoy sin's fleeting pleasure. Uh, So he made a decision that, uh, yes, if I go with these uh, uh, Hebrew slaves, then then I will be mistreated and uh, I will be, uh, you know, criticized. I will be threatened. Who knows everything that's going to happen, but I'm going to do it anyway. Number three, he regarded abuse, suffer for Christ, to be of greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. And most certainly the treasures of Egypt all lay right at his feet. It was all like right there, but he rejected all of that. He walked away from all of that to suffer abuse for Christ's sake, uh, along with the people of God. Number four, he fixed his eyes on the reward. And shortly I'm going to break all of that down to see what that means to you and to me today. By faith, number five, he left Egypt without fearing the king's anger. Now, that's not the first time he left Egypt to rush out into the desert to hide himself. By now, he's leading uh, a whole nation within a nation uh, out of Egypt, and uh, the king was absolutely livid, was going to kill them all, and Moses had decided that his life was not going to be ruled by fear no more. I'm not afraid. He says, I'm now walking by faith. And that's the... uh, uh, Um, fifth point there in number six it says he persevered as though he could see the one who is invisible there's five six choices there and I suppose if we wanted to be technical about it we could call it five we could call it six anyway there's six points here that I want to encourage you with today six life shaping choices Uh, number one I refuse Number one, I refuse. I want to take that now into our own personal setting for each and every one of us. Number one, I refuse. You know, when Moses got to the stage where he said, look, whatever I've got right now, whatever I'm doing right now, it just doesn't fit God's purposes. This is not who I am. Um, And uh, there was a a reason and a purpose for me to be here for a certain period, but I now need to step out. And status quo as it is right now is no longer suitable. You know, before we can effectively move into God's perfect will for our lives, 
We've got to refuse what's going on presently. We've got to say, not doing this anymore. Not, not uh, uh, bound by those uh, uh, current situations anymore. Not allowing the circumstances to control me anymore. Um, and actually, furthermore, Moses' mother would have been a lovely enough woman, I'm sure, when I say his adopted mother, um, would have meant well. And uh, sometimes parents mean well. Um, but sometimes we've got to just step out and just do what God calls us to do, whether parents approve of it or not. No, I'm not trying to incite rebellion in anybody. But here's the deal. While children are children and they're with their parents, they are commanded to obey their parents. But when we're adults in our own right, and already perhaps have moved on and are married, we are our own household now. And we're still called to honor our parents. But we're not necessarily called to obey our parents. And it's gone very quiet here this morning. <laughs> and, and, you know, in most situations this doesn't apply because most parents are quite reasonable uh, and so forth. But sometimes parents can be a bit overbearing and always down on their kids who are by now adults and everything. And if God calls us to do something at a certain point, we're going to say, look, I'm not going to have my life defined by others anymore. I need to follow the leading of the Lord. And I guess it brings us to letter A here. I refuse to let my life be defined by others. Yes, parents have a vision for their children and praise God for that. And mostly it's a good vision and it's good and, and everything else. But in this instance here, it took Moses away from what his mother had in mind for him. It took Moses away from what his grandfather, the, um, the pharaoh of Egypt, had in mind for him because they all had his, ma his life mapped out. You know, it's all very well to look at the princes, uh, uh, even of the Commonwealth of, of, uh, of England, you know, and say, uh, gosh, you know, they got it all laid on. His mother is probably one of the richest women in the world, the queen is, uh, and, and there's not anything lacking. That's not to say that, you know, that they will be you know, just forever, you know, just spent money for the sake of spending money. But, you know, their lives are somewhat prescribed. Um, and personally, if I, if I had a choice, <laughs> swapping, you know, with their lives or mine, I'm quite happy with my life. You know, <laughs> so I haven't got people uh, around the world breathing down my neck saying, you shouldn't sit, do this, you shouldn't say that. Uh, and, you know, people in the courts, uh, uh, it's all laid on, but their lives are very prescribed. And Moses says, I'm breaking out of that. I'm now following the leading of the Lord. In Romans 12, verse 2, it says, uh, in the Philips translation, it says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice. Uh, underline the word there, prove in practice. We're not just proving in thought, not just proving in, in intention, but we're proving in practice that the plan of God for you is good, meets all of his demands, and moves towards the goal of true maturity. And that's always the deal. God's always leading us towards greater maturity. Because with greater maturity, we're able to handle greater responsibilities. We make better decisions in life and just maturity. And, uh, and of course, uh, for you and I, as, as the people of God, as believers, God God has set up Jesus Christ as the model, uh, and God wants every one of us to become like Christ. In fact, during our 40-day campaign, uh, that all the exercises that we're going through, all the different things that we're doing is, is uh, one of the main reasons is so that we grow spiritually and become, become more like Christ. And that's what the deal is here that uh, he says here that, uh, that he says, don't let the world squeeze you, uh, uh, world around you squeeze you into its own mold. Yes, we want to be kind to people and we don't want to be rude. We don't want to knock people back. But sometimes people have got expectations in our lives that we cannot meet, should not meet, and are not required to meet. Uh, uh, and uh, that's exactly what this is saying here. So letter A again, I refuse to let my life be defined by others. Now that's now not not uh, an open check, is it, for people to flip out and step out of everything. Once we've made commitments, uh, you know, we, we remain in, in, in the commitment. You know, as I say, you know, people that are, you know, married, you're, you're a husband, be the best husband that you can be. If you're married with, uh, and you're a wife, then be the best wife that you can be. Of course, if it's a highly abusive situation, you need to 
bring about some changes there. You know, we, we don't get married to be abused uh, uh, and so forth. And, and, uh, and you know, if, 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 if you're on the career path, you know, serve God and do well. Uh, as I say, it's not like everything's got to be tossed out and then we do our own thing. Um, most often when we get born again, nothing much changes. We're still in the same family that we're in and we're still carrying on with, 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 with our career that we've started and praise God when people study and do well or they pursue a life in business and so forth. But occasionally, God says, uh, God takes somebody and he plucks them out uh, uh, of uh, their particular situation. You know, when I got to the, to the uh, sort of uh, nearer the top end of my career that I had chosen at the time in the whole area of hospitality, and after 17 years, just when I started to earn some decent money, God said, let's take you out and let's put you in here now. And, uh, and uh, you know, people say, wow, you know, this ministry must be awesome. Well, I experienced a third, uh, a third uh, to a half drop in income when I stepped into the ministry. And, uh, and, and I'm not in any way complaining. But sometimes, you know, there is a certain price to be paid in order to pursue the plan of God for our lives. And, uh, and it most certainly isn't about money. It's about being in the center of God's will. And whatever it means, we've got to pursue that. I remember when Kenneth Hagin tells the story how um, God called him to leave the pastorate uh, and to go out on the road. And uh, he'd heard about all of these missionaries that were starving and about these traveling ministers that weren't looked after well. And, but God had put it in his heart to go out and travel and to teach faith to the people around the place, mostly within uh, America, but he traveled to uh, some other parts of the world. There's a, there's a, I guess at that stage he would have been, what, 30, 40 years old. Uh, and uh, he'd also come to New Zealand, actually, uh, though there abused him so much here that he decided he wasn't ever going to come back again. You know, it's a sad story when, uh, when nations or, or communities ab abuse the, the very people that God sends uh, to be a part of the answer, a part of the solution. And uh, I remember him talking about it. There's a price to be paid. By now he's got a wife, he's got children, but he's out traveling because that's what God called him to do. So sometimes there's a, a high price tag attached to what God calls us to do. But if God calls us to do it and we've sought counsel and we've heard from God and we've verified that yes, this is the plan of God, then we've got to do the plan of God. Praise God. Is everybody all right this morning? So I refuse to let my life be defined by others. Uh, let it be, I resolve that I will no longer be, def be defined by anyone except by God. You know, ultimately, we've all got responsibilities. We've got connections. We are, we are within a, a uh, you know, system of relationships, uh, which, uh, you know, many times is all good and proper. Sometimes certain relationships uh, need to be terminated because unhealthy relationships is one of the things that keeps people out of the will and out of the plan of God. But otherwise, we just have to determine to follow God. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Our purpose is to please God not people. Please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our hearts. You know, there's a deal sometimes where we like to be liked, but certain decisions that we make will put us offside with some people. In some instances, it may even be family, extended family, whatever the situation is. But we are not called to be people pleaser. We are called to be God pleasers. All right? Um, so our purpose is to please God. Uh, John chapter 17, verse 16. This is out of the message translation, and this is part of a prayer that Jesus prayed, uh, what sometimes Bible uh, scholars refer to as Jesus' high priestly prayer before he went to the cross. And he's praying for his disciples. He's praying for his followers. He says, they are no more defined by the world than what I am defined by the world. And they were in a world that was strongly religious. They were the Pharisees, they were the Sadducees, they were the whole Jewish council, they were laws. There was the Roman uh, uh, occupation force that was there. All of these expectations to do this, do that, do the other. Don't do this, don't do that. But Jesus says, I'm not defined by the world and my followers are not defined by the world. We're only defined by who and what God has called us to do. Jeremiah chapter 29 Verse 11, God says, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. 
God says, I know the plan that I have for you. See, God's plan is automatically blessed. Sometimes we uh, might be tempted to devise our own plan, and then we're asking God to search, God, please bless this thing. Uh, but God says, my plan's already blessed. Uh, it's a good plan. It's a plan for good and not for evil, to give you hope and to give you a future. And that leads me to the second point, the second decision that Moses uh, made. Uh, and I guess he purposely said, I choose. He says, I choose. Moses chose to be ill-treated with God's people. That wasn't sort of by accident or by default. That was by design. Moses knew exactly what he was getting into, and he had he had evaluated the situation and he decided that he was going to choose short-term pain to obtain long-term gain. Friends, sometimes the best decisions is also one of the hardest decisions that we can make. If it's always, we always want everything easy, we're not necessarily going to find the will of God for our lives. You know, most people's problems stem from their inability to delay gratification. Uh, they talk about instant gratification. And uh, that was great uh, there before, Matt, you know, talking about borrowing money and just the whole money management thing. People go out, uh, uh, I, I want everything, and, and I want it now, and, and I want it free. I don't want it to cost me anything. Well, you know, credit is free in the beginning, but it'll cost you later. One thing that I've worked out, and this is not rocket science at all, it's easy to borrow money, but it takes a long time to pay it back. All right? And you always have to pay back more than what you borrowed. And uh, so instant gratification, and most people's problems goes back to their thing. They just cannot wait. I need it now. I need it free, and I want it easy. And, uh, and I don't, don't ask me to make a commitment, you know, because uh, I don't want to be married, but I want to have sex, you know. I just, uh, I, and, and, and I don't want to work, but I want all the money. Uh, instant gratification and uh, living a life of entitlement rather than a life of responsibility. You know, people in the sports world, they live life by the motto, no pain, no gain. And anybody knows that does any exercise or anything, you know, building up your muscles, there's always pain. And if you don't like the pain, there will never be any gain. You know, every now and then, like when I've been doing certain things and, you know, climbing up and down of things or whatever I've done, and if I feel, you know, a bit of pain, I think this is really good for me. It means that there's good things that are happening. If there's no pain, I'm not exercising enough. I'm just, I'm, I'm just barely maintaining. You know, sometimes people's world gets smaller and smaller because they're not prepared to experience a bit of pain to go out and stretch themselves physically, mentally, emotionally, uh, and, and, and so forth. How do you know that people, uh, that there is a certain amount of pain attached to have to study three, four, five years at university and all the cost that's involved and all the, the social life that you've got to say no to in order to pursue something? Again, if there's no pain, there will be no gain. And sometimes it's like that uh, in the spiritual realm as well. If we're not prepared to squeeze the flesh and to exact some pain on it, there will be no spiritual gain. In most areas in life, we have to do the hard yards before we enjoy the rewards. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 4.17 Paul speaking, he says, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Paul, of course, is speaking about persecution that he had suffered and that they were suffering, that back then, gosh, uh, the Christians were certainly on the outside uh, uh, of society, marginalized, as they still are in many nations around the world, uh, you know, just considered the scum of the earth in some instances, uh, used and abused and everything, and, uh, and Paul himself just in mega troubles, you know, he was just rejected by the Pharisees who he'd run with, he was one of them, uh, and uh, and in the early days, even the apostles didn't receive him uh, because they weren't quite sure. You know, the Christians, are, oh, we're not sure if we want this guy in our ranks. He's actually one of our, our persecutors. Uh, but Paul had changed uh, completely on the inside. Uh, he says, our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but in what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. Friends, everything we see 
is, is uh, temporary by nature. But all the things that are not seen, God, the kingdom of God, heaven, and all of these things are eternal. And what uh, Moses uh, was saying, um, and what this is encouraging us to do, is to live our lives with an eternal perspective rather than just a temporary perspective. Yes, we have to deal with temporary things. Yes, we have to deal with, <laughs> we have to live somewhere. We should be able to drive something to get from A to B. We've got to put clothes on. We have to buy food, prepare food. We have to deal with all of these temporary things. Uh, yet we do so with an eternal perspective in mind. And number three, I regard. It says, Moses regarded abuse suffer for Christ to be of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. You know, Moses analyzed this whole situation. He thought about it good and proper. Um, Egypt's treasures were like right there. I think it would have been quite feasible for him to go to Pharaoh, humble himself and say, Pharaoh, I'm so sorry. I killed this guy but I, I will never do it again. If you just let me back into your household again, I'll, I'll be really good. Um, and I'll serve you and I'll do what you, you have mapped out for my life and everything else. But somehow, uh, he, he said, no, he says, uh, I regard abuse for Christ to be of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. And I guess uh, letter A where it says, he, I, regards, I regard God's values above the world's values. Moses evaluated the situation. He evaluated what lay before him. He evaluated what he had, and he evaluated what he stood to gain. And he made a judgment call and said, I'm going to follow God here. I will uh, live by God's value system rather than by the world's value system. You know, somehow, um, Pharaoh and the likes of him in those days, I mean, the word dictator is an understatement. They didn't rule by the rule of law. They ruled by whim. Um, they were considered a, a god. So whatever they said had to be done. And somehow Moses had it made because he had all the fame, all the fortune, all the treasures. He had a good future mapped out of him as far as the natural was concerned. But somehow he decided that he was going to uh, choose against all of that. Um, you know, the world's values is popularity. Moses certainly had that. You know, these generals, when they came back from having led an army, part of the army, into a, you know, a fight with a neighboring nation or who knows what, and when they came back, boy, they were popular people when they'd won. Um, and so he had all the fame, he had all the popularity, all the pleasure. Uh, you know, morality was not one of the strengths uh, in those courts uh, of the people that lived there. All the place, it was all like laid on. I mean, Moses, what do you want? It's, it's all right there. Just help yourself. But he decided that no, no more of this. All the possessions. Um, all the possessions. Pharaoh would have been the richest man uh, in those days. He owned the whole nation practically uh, because as it was, Joseph, who was one of the, uh, you know, again, one of God's people, the way that he operated there, he made uh, Pharaoh a very, very wealthy man. Uh, and Moses became in many respects the beneficiary of it if he had just carried on with status quo, carry on doing what he'd always done. But he said, no. He says, uh, I regard abuse, suffer for Christ to be of greater value. Um, popularity, pleasure, possessions, all right there. First John chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Do not love the world or anything that belongs to the world. If you love the world, you do not love the Father. This is very strong uh, words, isn't it? It's like, uh, you know, that's not to say we can't enjoy nice things. We can't enjoy certain things. Uh, but he says, don't love it, he says, uh, and don't cling to it. In the end, uh, only love God. Uh, everything that belongs to the, to the world, verse 16, what the sinful self desires, what people see and want, and everything in this world that people are so proud of, none of this comes from the Father. It all comes from the world. The world and everything Everything in it that people desire is passing away, but those who do the will of God will live forever. 
<laughs> you know, it's everything that people desire or everything that people are proud of. Um, I'm sort of mindful now for us as a family, as a church family, in terms of the facility that we have. Um, we are, I suppose, proud of it in a positive sense, and, and rightly so. You know, there's a lot of people that done a lot of work and given for many years and, and you know, trust God for the blessing of God to have what we have today. And uh, I've said this before, but many pastors would, you know, it's a silly saying, but they would give an arm and a leg to have the facility that, that we have now. And it's never been as good as what it is right now. Um, as from where we started out 30 years ago to where we are today, this is just fantastic. You know, occasionally we get visitors coming in, uh, some of the pastors from a, uh, uh, out of town and so forth, and I sort of show them around a little bit, and I always got to check my attitude. It's like, you know, let's, let's be grateful for what, what we have. To, don't, don't be proud. <laughs> don't walk around with pride in your heart, because the Bible says the pride comes before the fall. And sometimes, you know, we can be much, oh, look, have you seen my new car? Or have you seen this? Or have you seen that? Let's enjoy these things. Uh, but let's watch our attitude. It's all there by the grace, and by the blessing, and by the favor of God. Um, riches, the Bible says, can be fleeting. Uh, they can make themselves wing, uh, wings. Uh, one minute they're here, the next minute they're gone. Um, and sometimes people, the better off they are, the prouder they become. You know, there are certain sayings that I, I find helpful. Uh, people say they climb the, the corporate ladder or whatever ladder they climb. And, and, and the saying is, be nice to people on the way up because you'll meet them again on the way down. Isn't that a piece of wisdom? All right. Let's be kind. Let's not in any way look down uh, uh, on people who are perhaps less, less uh, fortunate than what we are and everything else. And let's watch our attitude. The world and everything in it, the people desire is passing away. But those who do the will of God will live forever. Um, God's values uh, that Moses decided to choose. Where God says that God's purposes are more valuable than popularity. God's purposes. God has designed us and created us for a purpose. And we've got to choose that over and above a life of pleasure. Uh, and God's purposes will take us outside of our comfort zone. It'll take us, in some instances, outside of popularity. Take us away from people's uh, approval. Um, but as I say, the main thing is that God approves. Uh, number two, people are more valuable than pleasure. You know, Moses had it all laid on at the king's court, but he says, no, I'm, I'm going to be with the people of God. I'm going to be out in the wilderness. And it, it'll not be, you know, a, a five and a half, st six star hotel out there either. <laughs> he says, I'll be with the people of God. So people are more valuable than pleasure. And number three, peace of mind is more valuable than possessions. You know, Jesus says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but he loses his own soul? So that's why you and I need to live our life with eternal um, value system in mind. And I would not in any way like to put the brakes on anybody. If you want to do well for yourself, you want to build a career and build a life, I say, go for it and get yourself educated. Do the best you can and everything else, but make sure that that doesn't overtake you and suddenly become the main goal in life. And pleasing God is now no longer uh, a part of the feature there. God's value system, uh, Moses says, that's, that's me now. Um, number four, he says that it says that he fixed his eyes. And number four, I fix my eyes. I fix my eyes. You know, sometimes I watch these people that are out there, the surveyors, and they've got these um, kind of gadgets that they set up on a tripod. Uh, and one guy is looking through a glass. It's almost like sort of some, some sort of a... Uh, What's the word? Uh, some sort of a whatever this thing's called. And then there's another guy down the street and he's got a, a, a sign up and he walks this way and he walks that way. And then, you know, they set it just right because they're going from, from point to point to point to map out whatever they're mapping out right now. And once they found this thing, they fixed that thing. So, all right, this is it now. This is, this is now completely set. I remember when I, when I first held a, a, a rifle in my hand and, uh, and gosh, scariest thing, you know, like my older brother was a hunter and, uh, and my neighbor was a hunter and, uh, and I don't know how old I was. Uh, I was pretty scrawny back then. Uh, and of course, I'm big and strong today, but... Uh, <laughs> 
for this scrolling, you get a shotgun, and boy, that thing packs a punch. It, it just hits you hard. And, uh, but anyway, in the, end, uh, in the end, I picked it up, and I looked through the glass there. You know, you sort of look through this, um, what do we call this thing now? To, the lens, so yeah, well, and you look through it, and then, and then you find your target, and you get the cross eye just lined up, and then once, once, you, once you got this thing lined up, you sort of gently, slowly breathe out, and then you pull the trigger. You fix this thing right where it needs to be fixed. And friends, you and I, this where is God's purpose for my life, and once we find it, fix it. Fix it. It's, there's certain things that are no longer an option for us. We can't flip around, be here, there, and everywhere. Lift the lifestyle of a gypsy, uh, as it were, or whatever, that lifestyle of a vagrant, off over here, off over there, and everything else. No, no, no. Our lives is fixed. We've recognized, we've discerned the will of God for our lives. We join a family of God, and even there, people are sometimes way too flippant. Uh, just, you know, just off over here, off over there. The further and the deeper we go into the will of God, the few options we have. And the reality is, people say, oh, I don't want to commit because I want to be really free. We are freest in the center of God's will where we have few options. We're very bound when we think we can bounce around and bounce into this and bounce into that. I don't know if that means anything to you, but uh, um, I trust it, it helps you. I know many of you, you've fixed your life, you've fixed your eyes, and this is it. You know, we used to say, come hello, high water, this is what we're doing. This is what we're called to do. We're the people of God. All the troubles that we might experience, uh, all the price that's attached is typically a price tag attached in some sort of a temporary uh, scenario where eternally we will be very, very richly rewarded. So I fix my eyes on the reward. You know, for me personally, that uh, parable of the talents where Jesus told the parable of the talents. He says, the kingdom of God is like a man that gave talents to his servants and they went and traded with the same and uh, put them in charge of this thing and then they came and they reported back to him. And friend, there is a day of accountability coming for every single human being. It's part of our eternal understanding. And when uh, the first two guys came, and the, the master's response, which is representative of God, says, well done, you good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. I'm not so driven by the latter part of that, but I'm driven by the first two words, well done, good and faithful servant. Actually, more than two words. So that's one of the things that drives me. When I get to heaven, that's what I want to hear. That's very, very important to me. What's your value system? What's important to you? You should think about that a little bit because how can we embrace values if we haven't thought about them? There's various things that are important to me. Um, whilst, you know, in some respects, I don't care what other people think about me to a certain extent, but my name and my reputation is very important to me. And how I interact with people and how I'm known in terms of, uh, what well, is he a kind person or is he a rude person? Does he just, you know, shoot from the hip or does he think his stuff through? Does he talk all the time or is he, does he actually listen as well? Um, and, and does he lie uh, or does he twist things or does he always tell the truth? These things are very important to me and I know they are to most of you as well. And so they should be. The Bible says a good name is to be chosen rather than riches. A good name. We ought to have a good name. And you know, sometimes our name might have not meant a great deal in terms of goodness before we got saved. But once we are saved, we are starting a new history. The former history is under the blood of Jesus. You know, it's amazing sometimes when we hear testimonies of guys that were criminals and they got born again and how they radically changed the way that they operated and, and so forth. And that's what God wants us to do. Uh, our lives are no longer de defined by the past. It's defined by God's purpose for our lives. So Moses had a vision. He fixed his eyes. You know, vision sets direction. Moses saw the promised land and he discerned God's purpose for his life. He knew that God had called him to deliver the people out of Egypt. Forty years early, he messed it all up. 
But 40 years later, when God finished with him and when Moses says, I can't do this, with the anointing, with the grace of God on his life, he did it. Interesting enough, Moses actually never did get into the promised land. That's a whole other story and a whole other message. But you know, Moses actually, uh, he, 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 he had a fit of anger one day and he smacked the rock out of which came water. And God says, I want you to go out there, Moses, and I want you to glorify me before everybody. And I want you to just this time, just point to the rock. He goes out there. He whacks the rock with his stick that he had in his hand. He says, see you rebels. And he's letting rip. Friend, in a moment of rage, you can diminish the plan of God and the purpose for your life. And uh, in this instance here, I mean, there's a few other things going on that we haven't got time to get into. But, you know, Moses was given the Ten Commandments. And Moses represented the law. And God, as it were, amongst all that stuff that I just described to you, indicated that the law, which is Moses, can bring you to the edge of the promised land. But it can't take you in. God chose a new leader called Joshua. Joshua was the new leader. Joshua is just, actually, Joshua and Jesus are the same name. One's from one language, one's from the other. The law, the Ten Commandments, are like a schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. But then you've got to get born again. The law will convict you, but the law can't save you. So Moses was allowed to lead the children of people to the edge of the promised land. It was like indicating to God, uh, God indicating say, the law can bring you to the edge of the promised land, but it's not the promised land and it can't take you in. Only Christ can take you in. We don't put our faith in how good we are and how well we obey the Ten Commandments. We put our faith in Jesus Christ. And Moses had to stay on the outside, and he died there. And that indicates how the old covenant has died. The law has, has it been abolished, and we have a new covenant today. I fix my eyes. You know, Jesus, the Bible says, he set his face like a flint towards Jerusalem, knowing that he was going to die there, but he set his face like a flint. A flint's a hard rock, and the saying there is that once he had fixed it, he wasn't going to go down to the Dead Sea or down over there. He was absolutely going to go to Jerusalem. That was part of God's plan for his life. In the end, he died on the cross. Aren't you glad about that? You know, uh, the Bible speaks about, about uh, Paul the Apostle, that when he'd done his travels and everything, he also set his face like a flint, as it were, towards Jerusalem. Even though he knew that there was going to be trouble for him, there was going to be bondage, he was going to be tied, his hands were going to be tied, and sure enough, they arrested him, and there was going to be tribulation. But he went there anyway. And sometimes we're heading towards certain things that are not easy, to certain hard decisions that we have to make, but somehow... Uh, you know, the, the plan of God for our lives will cost us somewhere something. And if it doesn't cost anything at all, then we may never fully find God's plan for our lives. We have to be very single-minded about God's will for our lives and fix our eyes on the eternal reward that God has prepared for us. And I'm now moving very quickly to point number five and point number six. Point number five, by faith I leave and I will not fear. Moses left Egypt. It says that his faith was great and he did not fear the king's anger. And the king was angry. The king was livid. Death contract is still out on Moses. If it hadn't been for the power of God and for the blessing, he would have never left the Pharaoh's presence in the first place. When he confronted Pharaoh and he says, God says, let my people go. And sometimes we step into the plan of God for our lives and a fresh courage and a fresh boldness comes into our lives that wasn't there before because we know we're in the will of God. So let A, instead of letting fear dominate my life, I let my faith dominate me. Fear will no longer dominate my life. As I say, if I had allowed my fear to dominate me, I would have never stepped into the ministry that God's called me to. And gosh, I, I'm telling you, I wrestled with this. And not for days and not for weeks, I wrestled with this for months. <laughs> and the day came closer and closer, and the more closer it became for me to have to get up on the first Sunday when we opened doors, the more terrified I became. <laughs> Might mean anything to you, but gosh, I still remember it to this day. <laughs> 
You know, they reckon that the fear of public speaking in some people's lives is bigger than the fear of dying. <laughs> but whatever it is, my friend, a lot of people, their lives are dominated by fear. Just fear. I'm, I'm, I'm too afraid. I can't do this. It's like their, their lives many times are miserable, but not miserable enough to break out of their fears and to follow a life of faith. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.7 God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God hasn't given us fear. We had a spirit of fear before. He says that, uh, you know, that, that fear, the spirit of fear that we had before, but now we've been given the spirit of adoption where we cry, Abba, Father. Yes, fears are still there. They're still hanging around. And many times they try to creep in. One of thoughts of fear, or fear wants to grip our heart, uh, whatever it is. But friends, we get to the place where we no longer let fear dominate our lives. You know, peer pressure is just a fear thing. What am I? Mate's going to think. So, well, let them think what they think. You know, people that think less of you if you follow the plan of God are not necessarily the people that you want to run with anyway. People that don't love you. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are called to a faith walk. And faith sees even though it's not visible in the natural realm. He left Egypt, Moses did, and he did not fear the king's wrath. You know, sometimes people don't like us, you know, bad enough, uh, whatever that means. But Moses, he could have been killed by Pharaoh if it had not been for God protecting him. That's why he struggled when God called him out in the wilderness and said, Moses, time to go back to Egypt. He's been out of there for 40 years. Time to go back. And sometimes God calls us out only to send us back in. You know, God had to get Moses out of Egypt so he get Egypt out of him. And when Egypt was no longer in him, he was able to go into Egypt and he's able to operate as a man of God. Sometimes God gets us out of the world in certain instances, certain, certain spheres of influence, certain arenas, if you like, to get that out of us. And once it's out of us, we can go in there and we can be the spiritually dominant influence and force in that situation. But until such time, it's best to stay away. Sometimes people say, oh, we'll just go, you know, see my mates again. And, you know, the mates are still up to the same old thing. You know, they still, they're still, they're still get drunk. They still swear. They still run with wrong relationships and everything. And next minute, that well-meaning Christian, uh, you know, it's just like the uh, Bible says God, God's called us out of every tongue, every tribe, and every nation to make a people for himself. Because in most instances, we are able to move around freely and just, you know, somehow, uh, you know, trust God and serve God. But sometimes God calls us away. So, <laughs> anyway, praise God. Number six. Are you still excited today? Uh, you haven't gone home yet? Number six. We only got one more point. I persevere. <laughs> I persevere. Moses, the Bible tells us there, he persevered as though he could see the one who is invisible. You know, God wants us to look into the very distance. It's like people that do trekking or hiking or, or mountain climbing. They set their eye on the peak. And that, that peak is what they aim for. And sometimes there's two or three lesser mountains to climb to get to that peak in the distance, and then there's valleys. And then but we've got to go through the valley to get to the higher point. You know, you could be in a valley right now, but there's a higher point coming. God wants to elevate you. And you and I, we need to persevere even in the valley. Once I've set God's direction for my life, I persevere to keep me on track. I remember when my wife and I were in Bible college. They taught us about faith, and gosh, it was just all so good. Uh, we just lapped it all up. We just loved it. Uh, and it set us up for life. I mean, what, uh, I mean we were in a, in a good church. We were in Bible college. They taught us, and they taught us well. Um, I'm very grateful for it. Uh, grateful for these people paying the price to teach us the Word. It was just wonderful. 
And I still remember distinctly we had one teacher in Bible college there had a, a whiteboard there and he, and he drew the, the uh, 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 you know, a, a river or a creek and he, he, drew, he drew a bridge over that river. And that bridge is like the bridge of faith. And uh, faith will take you from here to there. But that bridge needs pillars. And he, he drew pillars under that bridge to support it. And those pillars are called perseverance. The writer of the book of Hebrews speaking to the Christians there says, you have need of perseverance. You have need of endurance. So that after you've done the will of God, you will also receive the promise. We don't just receive the promise by faith, but we receive it by faith and by perseverance. Because how many you know it's easy to start, start out with a great gusto? So, this is it. <laughs> this is it. I'm, I'm going to trust God for this. I'm, I'm going to step out for that. I'm going to pray and I'm going to trust God. And, you know, in the end, when sort of faith is there and uh, inspiration is there and we can see the mountain and then suddenly we slip into a bit of a valley and say, oh, this is a bit, taking a bit longer than what I expected it to take. And, and so now it's time for perseverance. Second Peter 1.5 but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly love, and to brotherly love, uh, to brotherly kindness love. For if these, if these things are, in, uh, are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So evidently, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we have to add to our faith. Add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance. Because difficult days will come, friend. <laughs> Challenging days will come. You know, we join a church and we think it's the most fantastic church out, but challenges will come. Things are going to be said that we don't appreciate. Decisions are going to be made that we might not like or we might not fully appreciate. Challenges will come. But we persevere. We, we realize that, it, that, that there's something bigger in life than us being right all the time or being consulted about everything all the time. That, you know... <laughs> I don't know how to say this in a nice sort of a way, but some people do think that they are the center of the universe. But friend, it's not, you're not the center of the universe. The, the world doesn't revolve around you. It revolves around God. It doesn't revolve around me. We're all just part of the, of the system where we're just all in God's family and we're all serving God and we're all doing what we can, but challenging days will come. The Bible says Mo Moses persevered. They're standing at the edge of the... Of the uh, of the sea there, the Egyptian army behind them, the sea in front of them. And the people are complaining now. Com you know, people, when people are having challenging times, some, they, they know nothing else to do but to criticize their leaders and to say, Moses, you brought us out here and you're just trying to get us killed out here, Moses. And Moses does the right thing and he says, calls out to God. And God says, why are you calling out to me? What, what is that stick that you're holding in your hand? Stretch out the stick. And he stretched out the stick which represented his faith and the sea parted. So, friend, if things are a little bit tough, a little bit difficult, don't criticize your leaders. Walk by faith and the seas will part and God will make a fresh way for you. How do I keep on track to keep God's direction for my life? God is very clearly determined to set each and every believer into a local church family and put everybody alongside a group of uh, what we call a small group uh, of believers that are able to journey together, do life together, support each other, give support, receive support, give encouragement, receive encouragement. Letter A, I join a small group to give and to get support. Somebody, somebody might say, I don't need any support. Yeah, but somebody needs your support. You know, look outside of yourself. <laughs> Hebrews, and I close with this scripture, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Let us be concerned for one another to help one another to show love and to do good. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together, 
as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more since you see that the day of the Lord is coming nearer. Friend, if you haven't already done so, I'd really encourage you As I say, this gathering that we have here today is what we call celebration. It's a very necessary, a very important gathering that every believer ought to be uh, in a a gathering such as this where we worship God together and uh, and, uh, we receive from the teaching and the preaching of the word. You know, we bring our our tithe and we bring it cheerfully and joyfully and interact with other people. But then we join a small group of believers, uh, three, four, five, four, ten, twelve people max uh, uh, that we journey with. Uh, We get into an accountability relationship with people. Uh, And one of the things that we are uh, looking at uh, engaging in is that we have a kind of a a buddy system in our small groups where people just are able to encourage each other to develop the habits that are necessary in order for us to get, get to the next level in our spiritual maturity. Friend, that whole campaign, what we're talking about, what on earth am I here for? It is a spiritual growth campaign. That's really the summary of it. I would encourage you today, we are ready to have uh, people sign up for small groups today. We've got our small group leaders, uh, uh, our small group hosts, with the exception of three. We're looking for three more, uh, but all the others are ready. In fact, if you have signed up to be a small group host, please come down now. Um, And we now finished uh, the message. We would like to pray for you.